over time, there was this understanding. It was like, okay, well, we're going to build this product and, and have all this foundational tech, but this, this is the day one product. This is the, you know, the launch product, but it's going to be very different. It's going to look very different on launch than it does at scale. And so the thing that I don't think everybody fully grasps and people are still learning to, to grasp this is like, truly, how do you scale? All these companies that have gotten, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment to go make electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles a reality or drone delivery a reality, it's still early days for them. They're still performing their first flight tests or their initial, you know, flight test experiments. Um, the true test will be the market when yeah. they're trying to move people and things every day and noise is going to hit them hard. And I think there's going to p- come a point where, th- where they'll realize we're not quiet enough. We're not efficient enough. And um, we are lucky to have realized that sooner than most and to have built towards scale from the beginning at Whisper um, so that when they're ready to accept this new propulsion tech, we'll have it. And not only will we know what it should look like, but we'll have built prototypes. We'll have flown them on real products uh, and we'll know exactly how they should be integrated for a variety of applications. Where does that come from, man? The ability to be able to think that way. I think that when I'll add this to the question, because I I think that when you have I've been a part of a lot of organizations, whether it's from tech to CPG companies, and you have a great idea, you believe it's going to work, you test it with your family and friends, and you know, it sounds good, test it with a couple more folks, and you go, I think this is going to work, and then you start building the thing, and then you get in love with the thing, Mm -hmm. and then you end up going, like, well, it's got to work, and now I'm going to need it. And then you get it sent to the market yeah. and everybody kind of boos it off stage. Yeah. How do you, what it goes through your mind as Ian to kind of help yourself and your team not get too far ahead of where the market is going to feel like there's a happy marriage, you know, coming in? Yeah. Well, it's tough. I, I think if anyone tells you, like, we know exactly how to do it, they're wrong. Um, or they're genius and I'm, I need to meet them like ASAP and you should probably interview Apparently y'all are hiring, right? Whisper. We're hiring. Yeah, that's, that's true. If you've got those skills. Um, I think, you know, everybody knows how to form, you, you go to school, you learn how to form a hypothesis and then you test for that hypothesis. I think when you take big audacious, you know, bets and you're trying to figure out how to turn that into a reality, there's two things to remember. The first is that you have to make all these hypotheses, stack them, continue to test, and then build upon your learnings to get to what your North star looks like. But I think the other thing to remember, and this is quite sobering, is like you can't get, you, you can't fall in love with your first idea. Um, you know, even in aircraft design, a lot of people, a lot of really uh, amazing aircraft designers, uh, they'll have some successes, but some every once in a while they'll they'll design something or a mission will come, and they'll design this this what is a beautiful airplane to them, and fall in love with it and forget like okay this this airplane it serves a mission and so being able to divorce yourself from that and realize the first thing you design not always the best thing to realize that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to be wrong a lot and to build in this kind of like habit or behavior to question yourself in a healthy way and also surround yourself with people that can ask really great questions as well and challenge your assumptions um I think if you do that, then now you have a healthy, you know, hypothesis, prove the hypothesis, continue to build. And then on top of that, don't fall in love with your first idea, but keep pushing towards objectively. Like what is, what, what do you think your future looks like? Um, you know, we all want to be able to move more freely and to receive goods more freely, right? There's, there's a freedom of movement that, that is pure. How we do that what that airplane looks like, what that drone looks like. Uh, that's, that's what you shouldn't fall in love with, at least not your first design. Yeah, no, I, how, how do you balance, it's, it's, it's the iPhone example or the, the Ford Model T example, which is like, you know, if people wanted, if, if I asked people what they wanted, I, they would want a faster horse. And, yeah. And, you know, and we're, we're building an automobile, yeah. right? Or, you know, a touch screen. What you were talking about earlier, people would be asking for better, faster keyboards on their phones as opposed to a touch screen on their whatever. That's right. How do you, obviously as a consumer and as someone building stuff for consumers, 
where does the gut come in? Where does your intuition come in to go in? Okay, I can't. I, how much do I lean into what the customer is going to want, and how much do I need to kind of shine a torch in a way that they don't even know? Yeah, I think you have to have an empathy to really understand your customer's viewpoint, right? To like put yourself in their shoes and realize like, I actually don't like leaf blowers in the morning. Um, <laughs> but you also have to take this perspective of, okay, yes, I have the empathy of the customer, but I also know something my customers don't. Mm -hmm. Like I, I understand aerospace in a way that your typical, uh, you know, Sunday morning neighbor does not. And so balancing those two things, understanding how they feel, what they want, and when and why, and being able to take your perspective and problem solve and realize that if this technology exists, how would they, how would they frame the problem or how would they look at the future? That's how you're able to kind of realize when is the customer truly right? When is their perspective truly colorful? And versus, you know, when do they not know enough? Uh, and I, I think, again, if you can go back to how they feel as opposed to what are the specifics of what they want, mm. that's when you solve for the right thing. Because, you know, let's take it to airplanes. When we go to folks and say, okay, we've got this electric propulsion technology, uh, oftentimes they say, okay, well, can you scale it up? Can you take one of these 10 pound electric ducted fans that you've demonstrated and can you scale it up to thousands of pounds in a single fan? And we go and say, yeah, sure, we could do that, but you don't want to do that. What you really want to do is be able to get to your destination faster and, and quicker and go you know, longer distances and use less energy. And if you really want to do that, it's not about taking that singular fan and scaling that up. It's about distributing. It's about leveraging that thrust in a much more synergistic way along your wing. Um, it's, it's about integrating the technologies in the ways that they want to be integrated, not just trying to force a new concept into an old construct. Um, I, I think that's how you get to really great products and game, game changing innovation, not just marginally or incrementally better, uh, solutions. Yeah. There's a real partnership. And even the way you talk about it, there's this relationship you're trying to have. It's not, you know, I'm smarter. Here it is. Or tell me what you want and I'll build it. It's. Let's help each other come to a point here that makes sense so that we can go on.